Hey, Justin, how are you? Doing great, Grant. Thanks for having me. You bet, man. Well, I'm, I'm super excited uh, to talk about, man, your journey as an athlete and, and life after sports and being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur now. But we're going to talk about adversity and transition and, and what it takes to, from a mindset to, to go through those things. And from what you've told me a little bit, um, man, you've gone through a lot of cool stuff, hard stuff at times. But you overcame, and I can't wait to share that story with my listeners. Absolutely, man. Again, I appreciate you having me here. I'm All sorry. right, man. All right. Well, let's, let's get it going. Let's get into my, my very first and always favorite question, which is about mental toughness. And I can only imagine just with all the things you've gone through and as an athlete, um, there's been a lot, of, a lot of mental toughness time. So when you think about mental toughness, uh, what does that mean for you? Yeah, when I think about mental toughness, that's a great question. Um, I think about a process, right? And for me, I think mental toughness is one of those things where in life, it it, it gets you prepared for like that next level, right? And and I, I kind of like, you know, I make this um, analogy or comparison to like how it was um, in a cold tub, right? Like it's a process. It only gets you, um, at first once you get into it, right, it's uncomfortable, um, it, it, it's, 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 you know, the first two minutes of the cold tub, right? Especially for an athlete, right? It's, it's the first two minutes where it's like the coldest, right? But after you get past those first two minutes, then you can go for four minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get to the cold tub again, then you can go for six and you can go over eight. Next thing you know, you're 30 minutes in the cold tub. And now my, in your mindset, you're thinking, wow, I, I at first it, I could only get in there for five, for five seconds. And I got all my, myself to 30 minutes, right? Same thing. I believe mental toughness. Um, and that, that applies in life. Right. Like I couldn't think about being five years old and having to cut weight or run around in trash bags just to be able to cut weight and play for um, a little league game. Right. But that was only preparing me for having to, you know, get to the level of high school. I being an athlete, you know, just having my house burned down, you know, my freshman year, going into my sophomore year, having a lot of different things happen in the economy. Right. Now allow me to be able to, you know, go and excel through those challenges on the field as well as being able to turn my grades around. Um, and, and be able to earn an athletic scholarship to get to Penn State, right? To where then I, I have to get a, another opportunity to um, enhance that mental toughness, right? Because we have a scandal strike, necessarily the career didn't necessarily go out the way I planned, and to where now I have to transfer to Oklahoma, right? So now it's a different form. Now I'm, and I just transferred from a, a school to where I, I, um, I grew to uh, grow a bond with the players and the people that I came in with, and now I'm going into a different environment different team, different part of the country, right at Oklahoma. And I'm going there within two weeks, um, within two weeks of a uh, training camp, right? Already behind two weeks. Wow. So it required a different level of mental toughness, which only got me prepared for the next level of going to NFL, which then got me prepared for the, this, this level of transition, which actually is this ongoing process what I'm going through right now. So going back to the original part, I think mental, mental toughness is really just a process. And it's just, and you don't necessarily get to the next process of your development, whether that's, you know, um, spiritually, whether that's emotionally, physically, in business with your family, unless you pass that first part of the process. So I think it's an ongoing process that we all take part in in life, whether we uh, are conscious or uh, un subconscious or unconscious about it. Right, man, that, that's great. And man, I, I say this all the time, almost on every show, and I'm going to say it again, but it's, I love asking that question because we all know what mental toughness is, especially, you know, people like us that have, have competed at, at an elite level. But almost every single person on my show has given me a different answer. And that's why I ask the question. And it's awesome. It's a good question. It makes you think. It makes you think, right? Because there's so many things that we have to be mentally tough uh, for on, but it's very interchangeable with other subsets of it, like grit and resiliency and confidence and all that stuff. So it's just, I, I love asking that question. Now, now I know you shared a little bit about your transitions and, and the, and some things that you had to be mentally tough with those transitions, mm -hmm. but can you, for my listeners, like share a specific time, whether it was a, a, a certain play, a certain game or a certain part of your career where you had to be mentally tough? I think um, during my career where I had to be mentally tough, I man, that's a good question too, because I feel like there's a lot of different right. parts of my career. Um, I think I could piggyback on the, the time that I mentioned a little bit earlier about transitioning, you know, from Oklahoma, I mean, excuse me, from Penn State University um, to University of Oklahoma. And then I could, you know, talk about maybe a time in the Steelers. But, you know, just from, like I said, going in with, um, going with high expectations, um, you know, wanting to play, wanting to, you know, contribute early. 
you know, ha you know, people that brought me in, the coaches, you know, said, hey, you're going to come here, have a great career, be top three round draft pick. Um, and, and it just didn't pan out like that, right? And, and to, to the point to where there was an opportunity for me to leave every year, and I wanted to leave and transfer, but Coach Joe just never really signed my papers. So I respected it. I never really, you know, I never really made a big uh, deal about it because I wanted to just contribute and get my degree and continue to move on with my life. But then when that that opportunity opened up to leave, um, and after I got that the blessing from my players and I took that leap and I went to the Big 12 and, and played for OU, you know, like I said, I, I made that decision. They were already two weeks in the training camp, right? So I'm already going into a different uh, part of the country. I'm going into a different offense, different style of play. And I'm two weeks behind in training camp, right? We can have two weeks behind. So when I get down there, um, you know, when you talk, when you talk, when I, I, I talk about as far as having the ability to execute, right? When I do my speeches, when I talk about, you know, you know, being able to execute in your identity and executing whatever you have to do in life. And when I think about executing, I think about when I was down there and my schedule was waking up at five o'clock in the morning, going and getting breakfast, coming back, going to, uh, you know, watch film, get pre-practice tape, have a team meeting, have a special teams meeting, have a position group meeting, you know, have a, 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 a wide receiver group meeting, then go out and practice for two to two to three hours, come back, get lunch, go practice again, right? Wow. Stay after and get extra reps with Landry to get back, to get caught up, right? So get extra reps after the second practice, go check in for dinner, come back over, get treatment. It's probably about five or six o'clock, watch film until eight or nine. And then with, and when everybody else was going back to the dorm rooms until 10 o'clock lights out, I'm staying at the, the door, I'm staying at the football building until I fell asleep. Like just wow. watching film, literally was falling asleep in the locker room and slept in the locker room for pretty well, a week to two weeks, right? Because I, I literally was like, you know, this is the sacrifice and commitment that I have to make in order to be able to start, right? Learn the playbook, make enough plays to be able to start, to stay on path with the, the actual goal that I had was to be able to play, you know, high level college football and have an opportunity to play at the next level. So by me doing that for two weeks um, and literally changing the whole first one in the building, last one to leave rule because I sucked at the building, right? <laughs> um, but after me doing that for two weeks, it was allowed me to kind of uh, really catch on to the playbook, um, make a lot of plays in the, the week that I had, you know, a couple of weeks that I had in training camp and earn a starting spot. And then, like I said, that allowed me the opportunity to be the pick in the 186 pick in the drafts, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Wow. You know, and I can only imagine when when you commit to yourself to that standard. Not only are are you getting yourself prepared mentally and physically, and emotionally and spiritually, but your team is like looking at you, going, "The new dude really wants it." You know, and that's and to, and to me, you know what I mean. Like I love that stuff when I see someone just doing all doing all the hard work in the dark, right? And I love I love this saying: "Do do all the hard work in the dark so you can shine in the light." And that's what you did, man. And uh, and I can I can empathize with you just because when, you know, when I went to junior college or left junior college to go to Division two football, um, yeah. I mean, I've I came out of a I mean, it broke records, team broke records. I mean, I thought I was going somewhere big, and and then I just wasn't going anywhere, and then decided maybe I'm not gonna play football anymore, and it was just kind of a weird feeling. Yeah. Well, long story short, obviously I'm not gonna go at all because this is about you, not about me, but I can, I can empathize right. with you because I, I had six weeks to learn uh, the West Coast offense at Sonoma mm -hmm. State. And my, yeah. my whole life, my whole life, I was a wing T quarterback. Mm -hmm. I, was one of the, I was a weird, tall, fairly fast option quarterback, play action pass, right? But then I went into that and I was like, I had six weeks to learn it before the first game. And uh, mm -hmm. And it was tough, man. Hey, man, that's, that's a lot of verbiage with that offense. Oh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a ton. But, um, but, but going back to you, though, with, with getting, getting drafted by the Steelers, like, what, what was that like? Oh, it was, a, it was a dream come true. You know, I mean, I can literally remember having dreams of, you know, how it was going to be, you know, running out in the stadium. Um, just like I said, being a – being a kid that was a, 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 a an athlete at heart, right? Like just loved any type of sport. Um, would always wear like I would wear this type of type of athletic wear to school. Like this is what I thought was cool. You know what I mean? Like I, this is what I, I who I thought I was. So I, you know, being a professional athlete at a young age was something was a, a profession that I thought um, I would that I just knew I was going to have to I was going to be able to obtain. Um, but 
you know, at the same time, as you get older, right, it starts out as a dream. And then as you get older and you're playing in the little leagues and you understand that, okay, there's a lot of competition out locally, you start to get older. And as you're competing you're, and you're still at those levels, you're realizing that, you know, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of athletes out there just like you. So to get to that level um, to where less than one percent gets to right is just nothing short of a blessing. Um, and the way that I got there, right, the hurdles, um, the obstacles that from, you know, even just, you know, starting back in like high school, just, you know, in um, the obstacles that I had to kind of overcome. That's what I believe is, you know, kind of made it all come full circle when I heard my name uh, called. And when I got that phone call and Coach Tomlin and the Rooney family, you know, they, they broke the news that they were going to draft me, you know, in a, in a situation where I didn't even think I was going to get drafted. So um, that night, you know, with my family, uh, celebrating with my family, that's the night I'll never forget. And then, you know, even just being grateful for the Steelers organization to, to draft me um, and to believe in me and be able to contribute um, to a great first class organization was something that I always be able to take with me. Man. And, uh, you know, I've shared this with you before, but it's, you know, the Steelers are my second team because my wife loves Steelers. So, um, so I can only just imagine, you know, and that's just an incredible program organization, um, top yeah. down, you know, but then as far as when you, you know, you were there for a short time and then ended up going to the bills and then you went to the Canadian football league and then you had it, you're starting to deal with some injuries. Yep. How did you deal with those injuries um, and, and how did you bounce back and then keep yourself motivated? Um, so, yeah, that was a real difficult moment in my life. Um, granted, it was one of the first mom first times in my life that I can think of where I actually had to overcome a real like uh, season and the injury. I never had an injury that kept me out of a game. Um, I never really had injuries that kept me out of practice in all of sports. Right. Um, the last time I think that I had an injury before that, that was um, that went over a long time was when I was in high school, right? And that just kept me out for a summer, but I was still able to play the season. So to, to when I first, I got released, picked up, got right, released from the Steelers, picked up by the Bills, going into that, uh, my second week of training came with the Bills. My foot that I just thought was just, I was battling with since before where I had reported the training camp just from soreness, it actually had turned out after we had gotten MRIs. Um, and I had ended up actually, I'll never forget, I caught my last uh, NFL pass from Matt Castle, um, play action, right? Chris Hogan's in the slot. Uh, Shady McCoy's in, the, in in backfield, right? He play actions. And I run a deep post, a win post. And I, I pretty much spin the DB. It's zero coverage, right? So by the time I'm out of my break, Castle puts the ball right on me. And I trot it into the end zone for like a 70-yard play, right? On a broken foot. And I didn't even know it. So wow. I'm just thinking my foot's sore. Um, I go get the MRI later that day. I come back out. Um, the, the next day, my helmet's gone, right? And NFL, if your helmet's gone, that means that, you know, you're not a rookie, especially if it's a rookie, you might have, you know, a prank, right? right. But if you're not a rookie, that means that somebody, you know, they need your helmet because that's your job. So when I see that my helmet's not there, I start looking around, hey, what's going on? They, I go to the back of the, um, the, to the back of the training room and it's all filled with doctors, right? So they tell me to come back and my head drops. So I already know it's not good. And they pull the, I see the film, broken foot, right? Fifth metatarsal. So now I'm out for about, they said I'm out for seven or eight weeks. Um, I'm training rehabbing back locally in Pittsburgh. And I was, um, at the time, um, I was able to get more time with my daughter too, because my daughter was out in Vegas. So I said, you know what, let me go ahead and travel out to Vegas and rehab, continue rehabbing out there and get time, more, a lot of time with my daughter. So while I was doing that, I was training and rehabbing my foot. My foot's about 80%. And I'm rehabbing and training with a few athletes at UNLV. And we're just doing some one-on-one -on -one routes. My foot's about 70, 80%. And literally as I'm running a post route, I felt like uh, like I had been stabbed across my thigh, right? So then now I tore my quad. So out with a broken foot, I was still trying to rehab just and get my foot back in shape and get an opportunity to be able to play in a camp or, you know, get called in for a workout. Now I tear my quad, right? So now I'm out the season, now I'm out two NFL seasons, right? And they call it NFL not for long. What have you done for me lately, right? right. So as I'm out now, that's starting to wear on my mind. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, never really been hurt in my life, right? Never been, never had a season in the injury or been away from the game, right? And now um, I have a, I've had a season in the injury, two, two season in the injuries. Um, I'm also dealing with different things personally, right? My personal life and like my life is just, it's starting to flip upside down, right? I just, two years ago, I just got drafted biggest, you know, everything's right, bright side. I'm contributing, starting into my second year. Like I'm playing, I'm literally getting reps. And now I'm battling two season in the injuries and I'm just trying to struggle to kind of keep my head above water with my career and in certain personal challenges. Um, I get an opportunity to play across the border at, for the Toronto Argonauts. So now I'm thinking in my mind, like, okay, I get myself to that mindset of like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm, it's going to be 
you know, the first time I get hurt, it's, you know, set up for a greater comeback. The second time it's like, all right, this is going to be a great story. Right. But when I get to Toronto, same thing going to that second week, um, I felt like my, my, like my groin was a little bit like sore, but it was more so like my hip flexor. So I'm just thinking, you know, it's training camp, right? Your hip flexor is going to get sore when you run, especially for receivers, right. cornerbacks, oh, yeah, right? For sure. So, so I'm like, okay, it's not, no, no sweat. And then my, my knee, right? My, my right groin was sore, my right hip flexor, my left knee was a little bit sore too. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe overcompensation, like, you know, maybe it's something going on, right? Cause as I'm getting injured, I'm starting to learn more about my body, right? So I'm learning yeah. the conversation, I'm learning how everything connects. Like you totally. wait till, and that's a whole different conversation. You wait till you get hurt and start to learn how you can take care of it. But, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, so, so then I'm like, okay, you know, but I, I go get an MRI, right? So I'm like, you know, my, my knees hurt a little bit to the point to where throughout practice, I never forget the rear posey, right? Great phenomenal receiver played for the Texans, played for Ohio State um, for a long time, for, for four years in college. Um, and he was with me. He was like, come on, JB, like, just push through it. And I remember just telling him, like, I, I can't. Like, my, my my hip was hurting. I mean, my groin was hurting so bad. And my knee was hurting so bad that I couldn't even, like, jog anymore. And mm. that's when I was like, I'll never forget that feeling. Like, damn, it's like, is my career, like, over with? Like, is it done? You know? So um, I, I, after the practice, I go get an MRI, come back. It's not my knee. It's, it's not my, uh, my, my groin. But it's actually higher up in my psoas on my right side of my body. So right foot right uh, quad was torn, and now my right psoas was torn three centimeters, right? So now they're like, you're out for another seven weeks. Third season end the injury in a row. Now I'm back home, right? Now I'm going through the whole nine. Depression, anxiety, fear, right? Uh, it's another thing on, on top of that, I had two years ago, right, before this, had a conversation with AB, um, training with him, you know, out, outside of the local high school. And after we had gotten done training, we were going to go hit the weight room after his chef had prepared a meal and everything, right? So we're having this conversation, sharing a meal. And he asked me, he was like, so JB, like, who are you? And I was just like, like, I'm a football player, you know? Yeah, like, I'm right. thinking, like, okay, what's going on? Why did he ask me this? And like, he looked at me, he was like, don't let this game do that to you. I'm like, what are you talking about, right? So I, I like, I shrugged it off. I, I think I just gave him like another general answer and um, we just, just paid it no mind, right? And then now two years later, I'm thinking I'm having that, that, that same thought, right? And I'm on the couch. I can barely walk up and down the stairs because my body's already going to be going through so much lower body pain, right? So, and I'm thinking as I'm brushing my teeth in the morning, like, who are you? Who are you? And what used to get me, Grant, was the fact that I could no longer even say that I was a football player because now I'm removed from that game for three years, right? Yeah. I, and so now that whole identity is like, my identity is completely shut out, right? Again, I'm still going through different personal challenges off the field. Um, so not even having that... Um, you know, that, that, that safe haven to go to, right? Because football and sports or um, even whatever type of hobby for people, those are those, those are safe havens for you to go to to um, maybe express yourself in different ways or um, to get away from some of the other challenges you're having in life. So as I'm having these challenges in life, I can't even go express myself at, like I've been used to doing for the past 20 plus years of my life, right? So now trying to find ways to, um, to be able to compensate for that, right? Like how am I going to be able to substitute another way to um, express myself another way to uh you know be passionate about something that i would like the same way that i was about football so just that in itself um was a was a very hard transition um and if i'm being completely transparent it's, it's not like you know now here i am and i'm arriving and everything's fine because that you have to understand that when you're an athlete and i say this all the time right like when you're when you're trained when you're not being trained but when you're um, going to school and you want to be a doctor you want to be a lawyer right you are you're you know that you're working your way up to like those highest points and you can actually extend that career and from your past your prime to, you know, your senior years. Right. Yeah. But when you're an athlete, it's backwards. It's backwards. You're already starting knowing that no matter how much training you do, no matter how hard you work, no matter how talented you are, you have a shelf life, right? Yeah. Unless you're Tom Brady, that shelf life is going to be around if you're in, if you're lucky, fortunate, yeah. blessed, <laughs> it's going to be around late twenties, early thirties. Right. right, but you still have 40 years to still live, right? You still 40, 50, 60 years to still live. So, um, just so from going back from you know being training, being you know trained to play football, um, all those years to now shifting and not even having a um a plan, right? Having a degree, right? But not even thinking that I'm going. I'm always thinking that I'm going to play 10 years in the league. Now I'm going to play two years and have to transfer and pivot, right? So not having a plan and having to um you know having to make those moves was was really very challenging uh, for me at that time. So, you know, like I said, just, just having to now pivot even now today, it's still, it can still be challenging. But I think a lot of the things that I, I lean on is the certain things that I learned in football, 
right? Yeah. From those different situations, from me transitioning from different schools, from me going through different hard times and still staying focused on whatever goals that I had to go through as I was going through those challenges, right? So even as I'm going through this process now and, and going into my second quarter of my life into um, the, the new thing that I can dive myself into, it's, it's now, okay, I'm gonna still have challenges, um, but I'm gonna still apply myself the same way that I did um, as much as I can, right? It's not, you know, business entrepreneurship, a little bit different um, than football, throwing on pads and running around. But um, there's a lot of different, a lot of principles that you can take. Um, there's a lot of different experiences. There's a lot of relationships that you can still build off of to help you in that transition piece. So as I'm still going through, like I said today, I'm still able to tap into those resources, to tap into those, um, those different, that, that different type of a mindset um, to help me get through some of those days, right? Because we all have those challenging days. Um, and as you're, as you're pivoting, as you're transitioning, it's not like you're going to wake up one day after your career's over or after you're, you know, you're done playing for two or three years and everything's perfectly fine, right? You invested yourself into a different avenue for so long, right? So it's always going to be a part of you um, to an extent, but it's finding healthy ways to substitute um, and, and find healthy ways to um, get that team camaraderie, um, to get those same type of uh, rewards that you used to get in those, that other environment as you played finding ways, it might be a little bit harder, a little bit more challenging, but finding ways where you can get that in, um, you know, whatever you're doing in the second quarter of your life. Yeah. You know, and the whole identity thing, is, uh, the identity issue or issues, it's a real thing. And it's, uh, and, I mean, I see it all the time with, with athletes transitioning out of sport. I had to go through it. I mean, shoot, I played football for almost 13 years and it took me almost two decades to like, to say that I was an athlete because of my injury Absolutely. and all of the stuff I was going through. So and we and it's teaching young athletes to understand that your your sport that you love so much it's what you do it's not who you are and that's why right. that 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 question that AB asked you that's really it's really important it's also kind of reminds me of a question where I hear all the time in especially when I was in uh, you know corporate America in the workplace everybody would like introduce themselves and say hey so what do you do and more often than not I would say in today I'd say well. I'm a mental performance coach. No, no, no. What do you do? Right? So it's kind of like someone saying like, who are you? You're like, well, I'm a football player. No, no, no. Who are you? So when someone says, Hey, you know, what do you do? I affect people's lives. That's what right. I do. The title of that is actually mental performance coach. But what I do is I affect right. people's lives. I give them control. Right. I get them back, you know, to getting them present and playing life present. That's what I do. Right. So it's, it's more, it's more connected. And it's more, meaningful more you know yeah it's just more passionate you know more connected and i think yeah and i think like the fact that ab right he the one he's the one that said that is what had me like wait like this this is the top guy that like him and julio at that you know still right they were like one a one b right so and these guys <laughs> telling me you're more than that they're like that's not you know and then to see you know how he dealt with and how he handled with you know what he did you know while i was with him you know it was like okay it's it's more to it's more to football Right. Right. Well, you know, when you think, and you've, you've kind of hinted on this a couple, you know, in a couple areas throughout you've been throughout your talk here tonight, but we both, you and I know as an athlete, um, no matter what sport you play, but we'll talk about football because we both played it. We get so much from that sport. I mean, we've get, we get discipline, we get leadership, we get communication, grit, mental, yeah. All time management, all that stuff. So now that your life is after football right now, like what do you think that you've taken from football that's helped you with this transition or is helping you do what you do today? Oh man, um, like every lesson, like every lesson learned, even from since I was like five years old, you know, I think when you, as you start to get older or as you start to, um, you know, advance, you know, in, in football, like as you start to go from, you know, Pop Warner to, um, high school to college to NFL, you start to really appreciate the people that poured into your life at those earlier ages, right? So I always reach out and I have the opportunity to all the coaches that helped me from a young age, um, you know, to where I'm even at today, right? Just reaching out and, and, and tapping in because you realize how much, how many lessons stick with you, right? When they're, they're telling you to, um, you know, sacrifice certain things that you might want to do in order to help the team, right? Those are different same things that I have to do today in business, right? right? When they're telling you about being on time, right? Like Coach Joe was really, really on, you know, if, if it, uh, a squad meeting was at eight o'clock in the morning and you walked in at 7.51, you were late, right? So like me being able to now make sure that I'm early, right? Having a meeting before a meeting, 
right? So like certain things like that, um, finishing, right? Not cutting corners. Um, just the fact that as you, you know, matriculate in the, in the sport and being coached on how to handle a lot of the different challenges, you know, in college with a time management, um, you know, media, um, distractions, all those different things you were, you were trained on at an early age to where now, you know, if you do the right, you make the right moves, you, um, you know, you build the right relationships, you can be able to capitalize off of all those lessons that you learned. And I think, you know, as I'm continuing to, you know, embark on this new transition on this new uh, course, it's, it's, I think you see a lot of athletes, or you still hear stories of a lot of athletes just that have not made that switch and that haven't found it, right? And it's not easy because, like I said, you invest a lot of your life into this is how it was done and it was only good at this. And, and on top of that, and this is an even deeper topic, not too many people along that line told you you could be anything good, better, or anything outside of an athlete, right? right. So now when you have an athlete taken away from you and nobody has really told you you were going to be anything outside of that, nor have they taught you how to pivot um, and transition using those connection relationships, it makes it harder right, for you not to, um, to, not, to not be able to use the things that got you to that point to help you in that transition. So I think, um, just to get back to your, you know, your question, I think that the biggest things that I think that helped me um, in this transition are just the lessons that I learned from trainers, from coaches, um, from parents of, of, um, of, 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 of kids that I've played with. You know, so everybody that was able to pour into my life, you know, from Pot Warner all the way to um, you know, the professional level, you know, those are the people that I, I really think about as far as what I do today that I can uh, contribute a lot of um, gratitude to. It's awesome. It's awesome. And when you, when you reflect on everything in your career, I mean, all the way up to this point, um, again, you know, it's always a deep question on reflection, but like, what, what do you think you've learned the most about yourself? The thing that I learned the most about myself, I would say, and, and, and the thing is, I'm somebody that already thinks a lot about like my career and what I should have did or how I could have did this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I would have had more confidence in myself earlier, right? Um, I think a lot of times, and, and I think it, as athletes, and people might not see this, but as a athletes, um, they, it's an everyday challenge with confidence, right? And me not necessarily understanding the difference between cocky and confidence mm -hmm. um, allowed me to, it allowed me to kind of, um, and not having uh, healthy examples of people that were um, confident instead of cocky, right? Not necessarily having the best examples allowed me to not to to more so shy away from that um, that preference, right? But then at the same time, those that that same type of uh, style was something that to where it could have helped me, it could help benefit me. So one of the things that I especially try to train or teach athletes um, or anybody when I talk about like the way that you apply yourself, especially when it comes to um, being an athlete and having even being someone that's maybe more reserved. Um, you know, maybe more introverted like myself, that, that's all fine and, and, and dandy, but you have to be able to learn how to turn that switch on for even if it's two to four hours, right? Whenever you have to do what you have to do to at least get to a competitive level to have confidence in yourself, not be cocky, not you know, be braggadocious outside of who you are, but whether it's an outward confidence or inward confidence, have like, have that swagger about yourself to where you're going to be, you, you know, you're the, you're the best athlete on that field, right? Regardless of how it looks on paper. Um, and I think that that's something that a lot of athletes struggle with, um, you know, being themselves as an athlete. You know, some athletes, you know, you, you, especially as you continue to grow um, in the sport um, of your choice, you know, you start to see athletes that um, aren't even necessarily, you know, out or extroverts, right? But they're just doing it to put on the front because that's what they are getting likes, right? I think social media is, right. are, is, is a lot of athletes right now be somebody that they're not, right? Like me, I, I I do social media way more than I did when I played. Mm -hmm. um, that, but at the same time, that's something that um, it it actually did not it didn't help me as I transitioned. Me being more uh, active and being more brand aware, um, being more aware of my brand, right? Having brand awareness is something I could have capitalized more on. So I think having more confidence and just being more aware, um, honestly, being more aware of how to uh, being able to monetize, um, how to be able to position myself properly in a trans to, for when I would have to transition. I think that's something I think uh, when I look back, um, you know, I probably would have did differently, but I can, again, that could be a different, a different topic for a different day. I could dive into a lot of right. different lessons. Sure. Right. Well, and, and again, I think it's great that you brought this up, uh, the switch. And I know that you and I, um, when we talked, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the switch and, and what's really important about that switch is if we can teach athletes to understand like who you are going back to that question that when you go into and commit to that role of being an athlete 
you're kind of you're switching into that role and more often than not depending on what position or what, what sport you're letting go of who you are to go be to do what you do is being an athlete but then you have to go back to who you are that means you have to learn how to switch it on and off and if you can learn that switch right then when you get into the real life let's say you have a family or you have just a wife you go to work right you got to switch on your entrepreneur hat and then you got to switch it off and go be a husband be a father, whatever it is. So there's all these different switches. And if we can learn how to switch that on and off, you know, there's different roles. It makes life easier. It makes transition easier. And, and I think it's great that you, you actually bring that up. And it's, it's, a, it's a great point. Absolutely. So with that being said, share with my listeners kind of what you're doing right now. And then, and then how can my listeners reach, reach, you know, connect with you on social media um, and learn more about you. Absolutely. So what I do now is I, I speak and consult to student athletes and coaches. Um, and pretty much what I do, the message is pretty much, you know, just delivering dive principles, right? And the dive principles are some of the principles that I believe um, helped me in my transition and understanding my identity, um, as well as help me understand, you know, understand how I can get through times of uncertainty, right? And the principles, um, you know, the D just, you know, stands for define, defining who you are, um, you know, defining your principles, defining your morals, right? Um, and then the, the I stands for investing into you who you are, right? And more so for student athletes, investing into yourself, um, you know, as far as, you know, spiritually, investing into yourself mentally, investing into yourself physically, um, and then making sure, and most importantly, you're investing into your athletics. Um, I mean, excuse me, your academics um, to make sure that you're doing what you need to do in the classroom to open and create those opportunities um, as they come. And then making sure once you do tap into those strengths, once you start to understand how you apply yourself and how you can uh, create systems and have people in your team and in your corner to help cover um, some of the areas where you might be um, limited in, right? Then you start to tap into your gifts. You start to become, you know, finding ways that you can add value. So not only now can you be the, 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 the quick starter on your team, but you can now be the quick starter for uh, that, that project, right? Or that, that community service opportunity that your school wants to run. You can also be the quick starter now for your family, right? So finding different ways outside of football or outside of whatever sport that you choose, volleyball, field hockey, right? Hockey, whatever sport that you choose, finding ways to use the same ways that you apply yourself naturally or what comes easy to you on the field quarter ice. <laughs> Finding ways to know how you can do that in your community with your family. So now, as you're you know maturing, as you're matriculating throughout your different levels and transitioning, you're now able to tap into how you already are going to not only have an industry to go into, but you're going to be able to know how you're going to uh, go into a, a you know a, a different different job role as well, right? So finding ways to add value um, through that aspect, and then after we add value. Now it comes down to executing, right? What systems, again, what systems, what programs, what do I need to do for myself to make sure that I, after I define who I am, I'm investing in myself, adding value in my community. How do I make sure that I can execute consistently as I transition um, throughout the course of, of my career and more specifically throughout life? So I, I, I go across and, and I'm spreading that message um, to this day um, through speeches. Um, I have a, a book that's actually about to come out for very, pretty soon within the next couple of months. Um, it's a dive playbook. Um, which goes over those principles. It's a workbook that comes out with it, um, and a course coming out with it. And then specifically, um, what I love to do is really train, right? And I train off of um, really a, a tool that is known as a, the DISC assessment, but the facilitation of the tool that, I, that how it was taught to me by one of my coaches and mentors, Dr. Eric Thomas, um, you know, it, it's phenomenal. And, and it's one of the things that allowed me, as I was going through my transition grant to, um, really lean on because it was such a it was such a phenomenal tool that allowed me to understand you know not only not only who I was and not even necessarily who I was but how I applied myself right mm -hmm. because you know you, we we can we are we can all be competitive at times we can all be interactive at times we can all be you know we can be supportive right we can have we can be structured when we need to but we all have different preferences so once i was able to be taught you know how or be able to see right by a report that's been around for hundreds of years how I apply myself and being natural and confident and comfortable in how I apply myself. And at the same time, putting together systems and putting people in place to the areas where I might not be natural in those areas. That has been probably one of the most biggest game changing things in my life as I've been transitioning. Um, so those are the ways that I'm adding value and um, the way that I'm servicing um, the people in my community and abroad. And um, we actually been able to do a lot of workshop trainings and one-on-one -on -one sessions with uh, student athletes and coaches and people that are just trying to get to the next level and understand um, how they apply themselves 
um, at, uh, you know, at, at a deeper level. And to kind of direct the, uh, you know, people, especially from your audience uh, to where they could find me, um, mm -hmm. you can find me on Instagram um, at Justin Brown underscore VS. Um, and then you can find me on Facebook at Justin Brown. Or you can find me at Twitter, Justin Brown underscore VS. And I also have a website, uh, JustinBrownVS.com. So it, it's Justin Brown. It's supposed to be about stand for value solutions, which is my company. But when I thought about it, I'm like, well, you know, it's Justin Brown versus too. So there um, you is. can Justin Brown versus dot com. But <laughs> Justin Brown VS, which stands on for my company, Value Solutions. Right um, so that's where you can find me. Right on. Well, Justin, man, thank you for so much for uh, sharing your your energy and your journey. You know, dealing with adversity is we we're, we all do it every day, but it's how we actually deal with transition, how we deal with, how we actually deal with the adversity as well. But just the fact that you're sharing your story, man, I know there's a lot of people that um, will get a lot of value from it. Um, I always do because I know it's important for us to share our stories. So again, thank you for being on my show and, and sharing your energy. Thank you, Grant. Again, appreciate you having me. Looking forward to doing it again. You bet.